Hey, good morning, King you. Welcome today. It's a great day to worship the Lord. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place to come and do what only you can do. Come have your way.
said he did. We believe it. Not only that, is he coming back. So there's a reason to celebrate, not just to remember. So this time our communion teams are going to be all around. If you missed uh, communion at the doorway, go ahead and raise your hand. 
would love to make sure that you get that today. Just keep your hand up. We're going to continue in worship this morning as we prepare for communion. We're going to worship in this next song and just posture ourselves in uh, preparation for communion this morning. And at the end of this next song, we'll take communion as one body. All right? Let's continue in worship.
hearts for uh, communion. There was this guy. This guy lived a while back and uh, he thought he was doing everything right and he uh, was a uh, real religious uh, and eventually he came to be against Christians and Christianity. He actually terrorized Christians and um, again he thought he was doing the right thing but he actually was coming against the kingdom of God. And Jesus responds to this guy, not in a way of um, like turning his back on him or casting him out because he had sinned, but actually Jesus reveals himself to him and his love to him. And he has an experience with Jesus. Uh, and he's overwhelmed by Jesus. And he gives his life to Jesus. And he goes on to write a pretty good chunk of the New Testament. And this is who once was Saul, now Paul, talking about preparing your heart to be in community and take communion. That's something we do together. And he says something really interesting. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, if anybody were to say this, it would be this guy. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. He goes on to say, that's why many of you are weak and ill. And some have died. What Paul's talking about here is the beauty of confession. The beauty of getting our heart right before we take of the body and the blood. And so confession really, guys, is just healthy. It's a healthy lifestyle choice. <laughs> and uh, I just want to take a moment as one body, a Canyon View, and those online. And I want to ask you to confess between you and God, what's the sin you've had this week, this month? What's stirring in your heart? If you need reminders of sin, it's things like I struggle with, pride, materialism, gossip, lust. So just take about 30 seconds and confess your sins specifically to God. Confession and repentance really leads to freedom because of what Jesus did. Paul again writes, The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he also took a cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So church, together as one body, we remember his body given for us. And we remember, Jesus, you shed your blood. We are forgiven, all of our sins forgiven in what you've done. And we remember today, Jesus. And we thank you, God. Lord, that uh, you are the foundation that we can put everything on, that you have forgiven us and that you are, as we are about to sing, a firm foundation. Let's worship. Christ is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I So I will 
that we can hold to no matter what situation, circumstance, or space we find ourselves in. Amen? It's good news. Hey, welcome to Canyonview this morning. We're glad you're with us at this time. Our children will be dismissed. To my right, your left, through those doors. Everybody else, hang out. Say hello to somebody you haven't met before. Tell them you're glad you're here. Hey guys, good morning. Let's give it up for worship. Thanks, buddy. Good job. Uh, man, it's so important to come together and worship together and be in the same room together. And if you're online, God bless you, but we invite you to be in the room. If you're watching from Kansas or Wisconsin, if you take off now, you can be here by Sunday next week, right? So just really glad you're here. I'm Corey, one of the pastors around here, and I want to welcome you. If you're new, everybody say, ooh. Yeah, well, thank you. Oh, the bag. Uh, this is a welcome gift, and we have some amazing folks at the Welcome Center, and if you're brand new, you come to this, you get stuff that's really good in here. Oh, there's even a granola bar. I didn't know that. And uh, then we bribe you to get your information and write your stuff down on a card so that we can connect with you. And over and over again, we have at least, I don't know, 10 to 20 new people every Sunday. And we reach out to those folks, and oftentimes that leads to a conversation over prayer. It leads to people getting some food. It leads to a prayer session and deliverance. Like, that's a step in the process of people getting free, all right? So we don't just do it because it's like a little thing to do. It's life, and death. Can I get an amen? amen? So that is that. Also, we have uh, every night in our life is a healing night. Every gathering we have is a healing gathering because we expect the kingdom of God to show up and people get healed. We also, at times, lean into special moments where we take a little extra time to lean into, God, what are you doing in the areas of healing? Healing, whether it be relationships, hearts, physical healing, of course, and we've just been really humbled by what God is doing. And so this Thursday at 6.30 over in the chapel is a gathering, a healing night. And if you know somebody who's going through sickness or any sort of pain and suffering, it's just a beautiful night. It's very relational. It's not weird. It's not hyper-spiritual, any of that. It's really loving people who gather and they pray for people who might be sick. It's literally doing what Jesus asked us to do. And so that is Thursday at 6.30 at the chapel. You can invite anybody you want to that, especially your unchurched friends, people who don't believe in Jesus. They're awesome. Bring them to that. Okie dokie. Everybody say okie dokie. Hard to chokey. All right, everybody, what is this? Box. It's a box. It's empty. However, if you wanted a box that was full of food and you need someone or you know someone who's full of <laughs> you know someone who's <laughs> Does anybody know somebody who's full of food? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. Uh, so um, today, every Sunday, we are giving away lots of food. We've been doing it for years. Today, it's in the parking lot here. For you to go over and get a box of food if you're in need at all. We all pitch in and we give so that we can be radically generous in Mesa County and beyond. And so either if you don't need food, maybe there's someone you know that needs food. I mean, have you been to the grocery store? Have you seen the prices? And so maybe you just get a box and you bring it and you do a, what is that, doorbell ditch or whatever that is? You, ding dong ditch. You can do that if you want. You can put it there, didn't run. Better yet, you hit the doorbell, you just wait and you say, hey, we wanted to bless you. Here's some food. And can I pray for you? And so after church, uh, go over there. I think they're starting around 11.30 and uh, get some food. Okie dokie. All right. And then the last thing, real quick, before an amazing uh, guest is with us today to teach. 
Uh, I wanted to give you an update. South Sudan and Myanmar. We've been continuing to do lots of work, not only here, but around the globe, right? And I think we might have some pictures up there. South Sudan is an area where we've launched uh, a number of churches, and I want to give you just an update. We continue to work in South Sudan, and currently there are literally 415 church plants that you have supported in the last few years in South Sudan. 415 churches. All right. Now, in Myanmar, uh, it's a little more tougher sledding with all of the different uh, uh, challenges and wars and all sorts of things. But you guys have invested and have created a situation where 80 churches have been planted in Myanmar. That's 495 total churches that you have been, and many of us have been there. I've been to both places, done pastor training. It's incredible. What's really fun is there's been 65 uh, baptisms in Myanmar. That's great, right? In South Sudan, this is not a typo, and these are vetted, and these are double-checked numbers. In South Sudan so far, there's been 8,022 baptisms. Now wait, if, and then I'll end up getting better. In Myanmar, and again, this is Ray, Pe- Ray and Noah and the Petros Network. They go, and we have people there that verify these numbers. The best way we believe to do missions is to equip the indigenous leaders. We are not the saviors of the world. Believe it or not, we're not. Jesus is. And so you equip indigenous leaders, people who are from that country, who know the culture, and just equip and resource them to do the Jesus stuff. That works best. That's what we believe. Or we also encourage missionaries and send missionaries on short-term trips to just give a boost to local people. You'll hear about that in a moment. But in Myanmar now, we have had, this is how many people have said yes to Jesus through these specific churches. 4,866. This is, so when we give, it's not only here, it's making an impact. A lot of this is from Pastor Kirk and his passion to, to get to South Sudan and, and, and Myanmar. Here's the last number I'll give you. South Sudan, number of believers since we started the work, 229,000 believers. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy what God is doing. It reminds me of that game where Michael Jordan kept hitting three-pointers, and he just looked at the camera and was like, I don't know what's happening. Like, what is God doing? It's crazy. Now, God's going to continue to do great things, and today we have a group of young adults and medium-age adults and old adults, doesn't matter what age, and they're going to South Africa today for about 17 days just to give a boost to the local missionaries, and I want them to stand, and we're going to pray for them. So where are you guys? Wherever you're at. All right, so... Everybody standing right now is on their way to South Africa, and um, and we're just going to pray for our offering, our giving, and pray for these guys. We all pitch in. Many of us believe in giving our first 10% to the church so that we can extend the kingdom of God, and this is the kind of stuff that helps extend the kingdom. You guys go on on a two-day plane trip. (laughs) To serve people, we're very thankful. And we're looking forward to the stories when you return. So church, shall we pray for them? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the uh, tithes, offerings, and giving. And we pray specifically now for the people going to South Africa on this mission trip to encourage and give a boost to local missionaries and local pastors and local people. We pray, kingdom of God, that you would come in and through them. We pray, Lord, that each and every one of these folks would be overwhelmed by your grace. When it's hard, when, it's, when they think they shouldn't have come, that you would just remind them that they're in the right place at the right time. So Holy Spirit, equip them now, fill them now. Let, let them see things they've never seen before, signs and wonders, grace and love. And we bless, and we as a church, guys... We send you now as missionaries from Canyon View Vineyard Church for such a time as this and all God's people set. Amen. All right. Give him a hand. Where's Wayne? Wayne, where, where's Wayne? Now, I want to, there you are. I want to introduce one of the things we've been doing over the last few years is supporting local churches. And one of the vineyards in the area is Palisade. It's the Mustard Seed Vineyard Church. Where are you? And uh, Wayne has become a very good friend. I love this guy a ton. He is an incredible teacher, great pastor. He's an okay golfer. And um, 
Uh, it's just, Wayne, it's just a, a treat. We're going to have uh, different vineyard pastors come in. We have a vineyard pastor coming in, Rachel from Greeley, who some of you know will be here in a couple weeks. We'll be having Paul Watson come in. We'll be having DJ come in. We'll be having, hopefully, Steve Nicholson from Evanston in Chicago come in. Mm. So we're having a number of vineyard pastors come in. Dude, you're the first one. What? Woo! Yeah! yeah. It's, it's downhill from here? Yeah. So, <laughs> so you, the bar you, got a, you got an accent. Where in the world are you from? Louisiana. Okay. Yeah. Do I still have it? Do I still got a little bit? Okay. So what's the one thing you miss for, from Louisiana, your home state? Um, gosh, probably just the food. Yeah. You know, as you can tell, I don't miss meals, right? So, the food. The food. Yeah, good food. Micah, your wife, makes a gumbo that is she does. legit. She does. She makes a good gumbo, yeah. Um, and what do you love most about living in Mesa County? <laughs> why is that funny? I'm not sure why that's funny. Did something happen that I missed? Sometimes I'm very... What happened? I would have to say the lack of humidity. The lack of humidity. The lack of humility? Humidity. Oh, humidity. <laughs> I love the lack of humility. <laughs> <laughs> your, your face was like, whoa, I didn't expect that. So you love the lack of Yeah, humidity. no mosquitoes, you know. Oh, Back dude. at home, I mean, yeah. you're fighting off mosquitoes and yeah. all that. Stuff, so. Well, gosh, we're really blessed. Um, Wayne has not only uh, um, been a blessing uh, as a friend, uh, we also, if you don't know, we invite vineyard pastors and other local pastors in every month to speak to our staff. I want our staff to hear from the body of Christ. And Wayne has come in a couple times to speak to our staff, and it's really been a blessing. Mm, so thanks, Holy man. Spirit, come speak yeah. through Wayne, and mm. we're really thankful. Give him a hand. Amen. Well, good morning. How are you doing? Well, right on. Hey, as Corey said, my name is Wayne, and I pastor the Mustard Seed Church in Palisade. And uh, man, it's such an honor to be here, to be able to share with you this morning. It's a real treat for me, and uh, I hope it's a blessing for you. I do want to take a moment to share with you my gratitude uh, for your generosity. And so when we were moving from Durango to Palisade to take over the Mustard Seed Church, uh, Canyon View, you, right, uh, there's been this support for the last three years that we've received to help get the church up and going and moving and trending in the right direction, all that, whatever language you, you want to use. But for the last three years, your support has helped us to do that. And so last summer, uh, we baptized 15 people in the river in Palisade. Yeah, yeah. This, sum, this summer, we have 10 people already lined up to get baptized in July. You know, summertime is like our, our time to go for baptisms. Everybody wants to get baptized in the river. So this summer already, we got 10 people signed up to get baptized in the river this July. And so I just wanted to say from me to you, not only are you supporting missions like you've seen on the screen uh, far off, but also locally. The church, the church since I've been there, you know, it was like 50 or 60 people was the church, and now we're 150 now. And so over, yeah, just over the two years, God has just been gracious to us. And I just wanted to say for me to you, thank you for partnering with him and what he's doing here in the valley, okay? Can we give you a hand, right? Yeah? Come on now. Golly. All right, real quick, a bit about me. As, as Corey said, I'm from Louisiana, Lake Charles, Louisiana, where I was born and raised, and uh, came to know the Lord when I was 26 years of age. I really didn't grow up in a church home or anything like that. And uh, my first church, one of the first churches I went to was uh, the Lake Charles Vineyard down in Louisiana. Was there for about two years and felt the call from God to my wife and I and our daughters. I got three daughters. And uh, we went to Durango, Colorado to help DJ and Vanessa Jurgensen church plant there. And so we were there probably four or five years helping them out. And then uh, Kirk Yamaguchi called me and he said, hey, what would you think about taking over a church in Palisade? And uh, my question to him was, where the heck is Palisade at? <laughs> and so we drove up to Palisade, visited a few times, got to speak at the church, and uh, really felt the Lord's uh, impression onto our life, his leading to say yes to what he was doing there. And so we've been there for two years now. We moved May of 2020 when everything was going crazy, lived in an RV for six months on a property, me, my wife, and three daughters, six months in an RV. It doesn't work when you say, go to your room, because it's like, 
this is my room, you know, <laughs> the whole thing. So we did that for six months and uh, finally got a place and settled down and put down some roots. But uh, that's kind of a, a bit about my story. We'll get into a little bit of that later. But uh, to start off this morning, I was reminded, I want to open up our time together by sharing a story with you from my upbringing. I was reminded of it this week. And I remember when I was 12 or 13 years old growing up in a small town in Louisiana of about 2,000 people called Iowa, Louisiana is the name of the town, which for many people, they pronounce Iowa, like the state of Iowa, because it is spelled I-O-W-A. But for some reason, us Louisiana folks, we just got to mess things up. And so we called it Iowa, Louisiana. Real innovative. You know what I mean? Real innovative. <laughs> So growing up in this small town, I remember at the, tw- at the age of 12 or 13 years old, asking my dad if he would teach me how to cut the grass. If he would teach me, 12 or 13 years old, dad, would you teach me how to cut the grass? And I should have known by his, the tone of his voice and his warning that maybe this is not something I want to learn to do. Because then once I learned it, from then until I can remember, I cut the grass every week. Right? I don't know what I got myself into. And so he would show me, hey, this is how, this is where the gas is. You put the gas in the lawnmower. You prime the pump. You know the, the pump on the side? You push it three times. You prime, here's the handle you hold down and, the, and the, cord, the cord that you pull. So he showed me all the stuff about the lawnmower. Uh, just give you a little insight into my family. We weren't up to date in the lawn equipment area. And so those self-propelled lawnmowers that people have, this was just uh, like a sled you were pushing through the yard. There was no self-propelled happening. It was just brute strength pushing, pushing through the yard. And so at the same time, not only did I cut grass, but I got a leg workout as well. Okay. And so my legs were disproportionate to my upper body. Like my legs were just jacked from cutting the grass. And after he showed me all these things with the lawnmower, there was something that stuck out to me that reminded me this week. He said, now before you cut the grass, first things first. He said, this opening here where the grass clippings come out. He said, you never, ever want to put your hand or your foot in there. Never, ever do you want to do that. He said, man, you can get seriously injured, lose a limb, uh, just be hurt really bad. So he said, first things first, you never want to put any body part in there. And that saying, first things first, has really been sticking with me this week. Come to find out, just a little bit of history. I'm a history buff. Any of you history buffs in here? A few of you. We united together, okay? Come to find out that saying, first things first, it was first recorded. The earliest I could find was in 1894 by a man named George Jackson, in a book that he wrote titled, First Things First. Go figure. And the book was about doing or knowing things in their proper order. Doing or knowing things in their proper order. Stephen Covey, in his book, Seven Habits of a Highly Effective Leader, states that habit number three, if you've ever read the book, habit number three in his book, it says, put first things first. And this is his definition for that. He states, Putting first things first means organizing and executing around your most important priorities. Organizing and executing around your most important priorities. Living and being driven by the principles you value most. Like there are things in my life that I definitely will put first things first. Can I give you some of those examples? Things in my life that I put first things first. When I wake up in the morning, guess what? First things first. Coffee, come on now, I thought we was going to get that. When I wake up in the morning, first things first, coffee, got to have the coffee. When I get home from church on Sunday, first things first, golf on the TV, me on the couch, and it's nap time. First things first, right? Anybody like that? Yeah? Priorities, right? I wonder for you today, what are some of your first things first? I wish we could take a poll in here and hear what some of them are. Husbands, maybe for you, you wake up in the morning and the first thing's first, you make the bed. (laughs) Wives are like, you're right. (laughs) Maybe for the moms and dads out there, you put the kids to bed and first thing's first, quiet time and an adult beverage, right? 
Moms and dads in here, right? Little kids putting them to bed, priorities. Maybe for grandparents, the grandkids come over and the first things first, hugs and kisses. Huh? Hug, man, you ever been hugged and kissed and loved on by a grandmama? Golly, there ain't, ain't no kind of love like it. First things first. And this saying for us even translates over into our journey with God. Maybe for some of you in the morning, first things first is your quiet time with God and your Bible. Maybe for some of you, life gets difficult, first things first, man, you go straight to prayer. Maybe for some of you, you get into your car, first things first, worship music on, jamming, I've seen some of you driving down the interstate, your own little concert in the car, just you and yourself, just screaming to the top of your lungs. First things first. Or maybe for some of you, you're here today and you're wondering or curious about who this Jesus guy is that we talk about. You've come here today and there's actually, this is actually your first things first in your journey. And if that's the case, can I assure you, I can speak with this with all assurance, that this is a great place for you, for you to bring all your questions and curiosities and wonderings about life with Jesus. And so if that's you today and this is your first things first in that journey, gosh, we want to say welcome to you. So this morning, we're going to look at the book of Ephesians, and we're going to look at the first things first. Man, you're going to, that's going to be stuck in your head when you leave from here, huh? First things first. That's what it's supposed to do. Okay. We're going to look in the book of Ephesians. And uh, the first thing first that Paul lays out for the church and the role that the Holy Spirit plays in that. Because you've been in this Holy Spirit sermon series for the last nine weeks or so. So we're going to look at what Paul lays out and how uh, the Holy Spirit plays a role in our life when it comes to first things first. So to give you a bit of context in this passage, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And strangely enough, he's not writing to the church because they've messed up or veered off course or something like that. Which is unusual because in every other letter that Paul writes to churches, they've kind of gone off the deep end. And he has to write a letter to them to correct them and bring them back. But this is not the case. What Paul's going to do in this letter is just to remind the church of these gospel truths. That's what he's doing in this letter. Truths about God. Truths about who they are. Truths about how to live this life of faith. And again, you've been going through the last nine weeks of this Holy Spirit sermon series, which again has been gospel truths. Truths about the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, hearing from the Spirit. These gospel truths. So today we're going to look at what Paul is reminding the church about first things first. So if you have your Bibles or your phone or you just, you trust me that I'm reading it correctly, which I appreciate the trust. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. So it's a, it's a bit of a scripture, but you kind of need it to get the whole picture. Here we go. Ephesians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ by Jesus. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in heaven and all things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, 
so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And in him also you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed in him. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen? That's the word of God. So what we see happening in this passage here is Paul is reminding the church of some things that are first things first. Four times Paul says, hey, in love, God has done dot, 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 dot. In him, it actually says in him three times. In him, he's done this. In him, he's done that. In him, we have received this. So it's almost like we're going to get to see how we should, it's like before we see how we should live and walk and uh, be in unity and put on the armor of God, right? These are all themes in the book of Ephesians. Before we get into all of that, he says, first things first. You need to know this stuff. And if you caught it at the end of the passage, Paul talks about the work that the Holy Spirit does. Did you get that? The work that the Holy Spirit does at the end of this passage, it says that the Holy Spirit seals us. And Paul is putting us in this little, this little passage of, hey, before we get into how to walk and how to live and to be in unity and to put on the armor of God and the husbands and wives, and before we get into all of that stuff, first things first, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. A couple of things to highlight for you this morning. The first one is, is that we are sealed as sons and daughters. We are sealed as sons and daughters. This word seal can mean two things. One, it could be it can mean possession or ownership, or two, it can be a sign of approval. Possession or ownership or a sign of approval. If you've ever seen the movie Dune that just was released not too long ago, the movie Dune, there's a scene in there where the emperor comes to the house of Atreides. If you've never seen it, this is just gonna sound like gibberish to you. But I'm a movie buff, right? So if you've seen the movie, the emperor comes to the house of Atreides, and they want the house of Atreides to move from one planet to another planet. And so then the guy who is the leader of the house of Atreides has to either accept or deny the offer. And in the movie, he accepts the offer. And what has to happen when he accepts the offer is they put a little bit of wax on the paper that they've agreed to, and then he puts his ring on that wax and seals it. He's approved it. And this is what to, the seal means, that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, that it's either possession or ownership or that it's a sign of approval. And in this text, it states that you and me and all who have said yes to Jesus and the work that he's done on the cross, we are sealed. That we are his. And this is the same language that Paul uses in the book of Romans. If you read Paul's writing, he uses this language over and over again. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Paul is saying in this, in this text here that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are sealed as sons and daughters. We are His. One of the early church fathers from 407 AD, I'm going to butcher this guy's name, but John Chrysostom is his name. John, can you say that? John Chrysostom. You're like, forget it. <laughs> he was also known as Golden Mouth. Can you imagine that? Is that, is that what y'all call Corey here? Golden Mouth? Yes, we do. <laughs> he was called Golden Mouth because he spoke with such eloquence. 
As a preacher, he spoke with such eloquence, so they named him Golden Mouth. But he says this about being sealed with the Spirit. He said, the Israelites were also sealed, but that was by circumcision. We too are sealed, but it is as sons with the Spirit. And it's this sealing and approving is what we see in the beginning of, in the life of Jesus. Before his ministry takes off, before anything miracles happen, before anything wondrous happens, in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Here's Jesus before any ministry happens, before he does any miracles. He just shows up on the scene and he's sealed with the spirit. And he hears the words, you are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. The possession and ownership, the sign of approval. And this same is true for me and you today. That by the spirit. We are sealed and the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are sons and daughters of God. We are his. And it reminds me of a story about four or five years ago. Uh, my daughter now, the oldest one, she's 17. And uh, we took a trip back to Louisiana to go visit family. And the two youngest ones were with grandma and grandpa. And my wife and I and the oldest one, we went to the mall in Louisiana. Just to sort of walk around and window shop and all this good stuff, right? So she's about 13 at this time. So she's getting to the age. She's a teenager. She wants her own space, kind of wants to do her own thing. And so she's walking in front of me and her mother as we walk through the mall. And so she's probably, I don't know, 20 yards in front of us. She's just got her own space, doing her own thing, and me and her mother are walking. And as we're walking through the mall, there's these group of guys who are walking this way as we're walking this way. Okay? And as these guys walk past my daughter, they all look back and watch her as she walks away. And here I am seeing this happen right in front of my eyes. And I looked at my wife and I said, I'm about to go to jail. <laughs> this is about to happen. Here in the mall, I'm about to go to jail. Because see, there was something happening within me. I, have, I never had to experience this before because they've been so young. But my daughter, she looks like she's 13 and going on 30. You get what I'm saying? And so for the first time, this fatherly, whatever you want to call it, in me rose up. And I was like, no. She's mine. This, like, like this jealousy within me rose up. That this is my, this is my baby. This is my daughter. She is mine. And can I tell you this this morning? You are his. He has this fierce love and passion and jealousy for you. That you've been sealed with the Spirit and we are sons and daughters of God and you are his. Paul is telling the church, man, first things first. Before we get into church life and ministry and all this other stuff, you need to know that you are sealed as sons and daughters and that you are his. See, this is the struggle that I have with this passage here, this tension about the being sealed as sons and daughters. Because can I tell you, if you walk this Christian journey of following Jesus long enough, there's times in your life where it doesn't feel like this. There's times in your life to where life has hit you so hard and you've fallen back and you're saying, God, where are you and why have you left me and you've abandoned me and you're wrestling with your faith and you have all these doubts and questions. And so to hear this this morning, it's like, I don't feel that. My hope for you is that you would. That you would feel the love of the Father in your life. But regardless of what we feel, Paul is right into the church and he says, hey, this is just truths that we stand firm on. 
that we are sealed as sons and daughters, that we are his. The second thing we see in this passage is that the Holy Spirit seals us as our guarantee. Seals us as our guarantee. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire it. The guarantee of our inheritance. See, in definable terms, what Paul is saying here is that the Holy Spirit is our down payment. He's our down payment for the kingdom that is to come. It's sort of a down payment of the kingdom within us for the kingdom that is to come. Now, one thing we need to know about uh, this, this language of inheritance and understand this morning, when we think of inheritance, we think of money and a will and becoming financially well off and goods and all this stuff are going to be passed down to us through the family. But this is not the inheritance that it's talking about in this passage. This kind of inheritance that we're reading about this morning is an echo of the inheritance that the people of Israel would have received in the Old Testament. That God looks to the people of Israel and he says, hey, I have a place in space for you. Their inheritance was the promised land. That he has a place and a space for them where God would be their God and they would be his people and God would dwell in the midst of them. He says, this is your inheritance. And this is the inheritance that is a guarantee that is true for you and me today. That God has a place and a space for us. This is our inheritance. That when the kingdom of God comes in all of its fullness, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, when there's no more sin and sorrow and shame, when all wrongs are made right and injustices find their justice and hurts are healed, When the lion lays down with the lamb and we see Jesus face to face and he will be our God and we will be his people. This is our inheritance. The Holy Spirit Spirit seals us as a guarantee. This is your inheritance. That we have a place and space in God's kingdom. And this is why... Jesus says, I'll just throw out a couple of scriptures real quick just so you get get the vibe. In John 14, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. In Luke 10, he says, "Uh, nevertheless, do not rejoice in that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. God has a place and a space for me and for you. This is our inheritance. This is the truth. This is the, this is the gospel truth. The first things first that Paul wants the church in Ephesus to get. That this is your inheritance. That God has a place and a space for you. And I'm reminded, when I was thinking about this this week, I'm reminded of a conversation that I had with my friend Gary Best. Uh, to give you a little bit of info on Gary Best, we met in Durango and we're eating at this place called Jean-Pierre in Durango. Man, you seen how golden mouth I sounded when I said that? (laughs) All eloquent Jean-Pierre, right? We're eating at this restaurant called Jean-Pierre in Durango, and we're sitting down, and I'm just hearing Gary's story. Now, Gary was in the Vineyard Church with John Wimber back in the day and was the national director, I believe, over the Vineyard Churches in Canada and wrote some awesome books, Naturally Supernatural and Where Joy is Found. If you haven't read those, read those. And uh, Planet Churches and Pastor Church, just I mean, just a phenomenal guy, not only as a person, but for the kingdom. And so I'm sitting down with him, and he's telling me his story. I'm like, dude, tell me, tell me, what was it like running around with John Wimber? So he's telling me a story of how uh, he would go on these trips with John and go overseas, and John would be on the stage like in South Korea or something like that, and he would be preaching, and he would call Gary Best up, and he'd say, hey, give him four or five words. And Gary's like, what? Just on the spot, you know. And Gary said after hanging out with John Wimber for a while, he felt the sense that John was 
discipling him. But there was one thing that Gary said caused him a bit of anxiety and tension within his life was that uh, all these people talk about having the Holy Spirit come upon you and God like anointing you and blessing you and a double portion and this is the man of God and all. Gary said he never experienced anything like that. And so it was really like starting to weigh on him. And he said one day he had this so-called sort of vision, if you want to call it that, to where he's, he's standing in this place and there's all kind of people in front of him and everybody's moving towards this one direction. And he said you can get a sense that direction that everybody's moving to, God's at the center of it. And so Gary being like, man, if you don't know Gary, he's like, he's a go-getter, right? And so Gary, in his vision, he's like making his way through the crowd, (laughs) trying to get up to the front. He says it's getting harder and harder to make his way through the crowd. But he says as he gets up to the front, right in the front, right in the middle, he sees a place that is empty with a sign on it that has his name on it. And Gary said that he felt God told him that, Gary, I have a place and a space reserved just for you. A place and a space reserved just for you. And Gary said he had this sense that everybody there had a, spa- a place and a space within God's heart reserved just for them. And he said the interesting thing that happened is rather than worrying about getting the anointing and all this stuff on him, he said it like empowered him to go live out the kingdom. Because he didn't have to worry about it. He had his place in space with God, and he, it was reserved just for him. And he could go live out the kingdom. He could walk in the gifts, and he can live by the fruits, and he can hear from God, and he can pray for other people, and he can share his faith because he had a place in space reserved just for him. He has a place in space just for you. I hope you feel that this morning. He has a space with your name on it. This is our inheritance. So Paul says to the church, first things first, you are sealed as sons and daughters, and you are sealed as a guarantee for your inheritance to come. So as we close... If we have the worship team come up. There's just a couple of things I want to share with you as we, as we bring this to an end. A couple of things to share as we close. The work that the Holy Spirit does with sealing us as sons and daughters and as a guarantee of our inheritance, what it does is it empowers us as followers of Jesus. And here's why. Here's why it empowers us as followers of Jesus. Because we have been sealed as sons and daughters and because we have an inheritance and a place and space with God, can I tell you this? You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to prove. You've been sealed already. You have nothing to earn. You don't have to convince God or will and deal with him. You don't have to bargain with them. You don't have to think or wonder if we are loved. It's already done. This is our identity as sons and daughters, as followers of Jesus. And it's because of this that all that you've learned for the last, if I can bring it all together, all that you've learned for the last nine weeks Hearing from God, the fruits of the Spirit, or walking in the gifts, the difference between the Holy Spirit and evil spirits and the now and the not yet, right? You remember all that stuff? Those things are vehicles that carry this message right here. Those things are the vehicles that carry this gospel message that we are sealed as sons and daughters and there is inheritance for us. And it's this gospel message as we walk empowered by the Spirit that your friends need to hear, that your neighbors need to hear, 
that your coworkers need to hear, that your family needs to hear. That what is available for them is to be sealed by the Spirit as sons and daughters and that they can have an inheritance, a place in the space with God. This is what is available for us. And so if you're here today, let me bring it back to where we were in the beginning. If you're here today and you're saying, gosh, who is this Jesus guy that we talk about and sing about? And maybe you're curious about your faith and you're just wandering in here. This is what you're invited to. This is why I hear of so many baptisms happening here. We are inviting people into this seal to sons and daughters in a place and space with God. So would you stand with me this morning? We're going to worship. And as we worship, gosh, let's worship with this truth within our hearts. Let's sing that we are sons and daughters and our inheritance is a, is a place and space with God. Amen? Do you feel the world's broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made? We do. There's no creation groaning. It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of it? Yeah. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah. Who conquered the grave? He is David's root in the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is he worthy?
just take a moment now before we go to lean into what the Holy Spirit might be saying to you personally. Um, and as we do that, let's just take a moment and thank Wayne again for sharing with you. Mm. Thank you. One of the things I love about you is not only your heart and understanding your identity, um, but that there's certain world, words for most of us that have one syllable that you have two. <laughs> I, dr- I draw it out. It is God's will. <laughs> I love it. And so uh, we just want to take a moment and just say, okay, God, what are you doing? What do you want to do right now? And so if you just, before you go here, be in a posture of receiving from God. And one of our leaders had a word that maybe through this um, Holy Spirit series, you've been wanting kind of this zap moment. You've been wanting a moment where you're just like, overwhelmed by the Spirit of God, and it's like this experience. Uh, Many of you have had that, and we've talked about that. But maybe some, you wonder, like, I haven't had that. Is there something wrong with me? Mm. Uh, Am I doing something that's in the way of that? And that is not necessarily the case at all. And Gary Best is an example of someone who has just really, really encouraged people all around the world and uh, hasn't had himself one of these incredible, like, mystical moments. But he knows there's a place in the space, and that has motivated him. And so if that's you, I think that was a word from, from Wayne and, and from the Holy Spirit, mm. that you have everything it takes to be a spirit-led, empowered follower of Jesus that's part of a revolution of love. Mm. You're sealed. You have a place in a space. Uh, If you're struggling with identity, that's a a common one for all of us. As we dismiss here, come up for prayer. Who am I? What am I doing? What am I supposed to be doing in this life? Does God really love me with everything I've done? These guys are here to pray with you. Wayne, what kind of comes to mind for a word from the Lord today? Yeah, uh, something that just stuck out to me is, I don't know who this might be, but you feel like you're in a wilderness feels like uh, the whole God is distant and I don't feel like he hears me or he's near to me. Really feels like one of those wilderness experiences. I just had a sense that, man, God really wanted to pour out his love on you. Yeah. Right? That we sing about love, his love, we read about his love, we talk about his love, but like this morning he wants you to experience that. So... Yeah, so how this works if you're new, uh, you come up for prayer for anything, anything at all. But if something is mentioned and that resonates with you, typically the stories we hear, when you step forward into that and then receive prayer on that, uh, gosh, it's kind of consistent that we kind of get these stories of supernatural breakthrough. So identity, wilderness, uh, if you need healing for anything, uh, if you're feeling like you haven't experienced the Holy Spirit like you want to or something... Uh, I'm going to ask you to come forward for prayer right now. So step out of your seats, come forward right now. Mm. And you're willing to, or you're going to welcome you all to continue to worship. Party in the lobby, of course. If you need food or know someone who needs food, uh, just, I think you got to come back around 11, 15, 11, 30 to get it. Um, anything else, bro? You good? Sounds good. Okay. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you with much favor. May the Holy Spirit empower you. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys.